The honeymoon idyll with my division during the Static War was destined to end soon. We were loaded onto a train and sent south. At 20 degrees of frost, Celsius, the unheated carriages with hard seats were of little use for sleeping. I thought back to my many railway journeys in the First World War. In those days it was enough to find oneself on a pile of straw in a horse-drawn carriage, where it was warm and sleep was disturbed only by the clatter of hooves. But those nights were usually over quickly, and for several days I had to make do with a handful or two of snow for a symbolic morning toilet, followed by a hot breakfast and a cigarette. The division, which I was now leading into the whirlwind of a swift and fateful war to save our army in Stalingrad, was materially weak. Only thirty tanks. There were no armored personnel carriers, one or two reconnaissance vehicles. Only thirty or forty percent of the trucks had been overhauled. This meant that in each battalion one company could move only in foot formation. Such companies were consolidated into a single battalion that followed behind the division. The repair company and even the workshops remained in the rear near Oral. Any lorry driver will understand what this means. Was it the result of suddenness, mad haste, or did it occur as a result of collapse? A rush did take place. It was mid-December, and it had been almost three weeks since the Russians had fought back decisively on the Eastern Front. This happened before we unloaded from the train to concentrate at Millerov. We did not know that the salvage operation would take place east of the Don. Instead, operational capabilities against the advancing enemy west of the Don were being studied. It was there that the front of our weak Hungarian ally had collapsed. While traveling eastwards across what seemed to be endless snowfields, my car met another. Out of it came the commander of the Romanian division, a lanky figure, a gaunt face. After a formal and rather strained exchange of greetings, we continued our conversation in French, for I wanted to familiarize myself with the situation of the Romanians. By his behavior, the Romanian general showed a clear alienation and a weakening of allied feelings as a result of the defeat of his army. Instead of deploying westwards, we were now marching southwards. Under terrible conditions, the division crossed the dawn at Simlianskaya. Despite a twelve-hour drive, I was unable to reach the headquarters of the 4th Tank Army. It was commanded by Colonel General Goth, who was familiar to me, so I spoke to him by telephone. Commander, do you realize that we must cope with this task in Stalingrad? I, uh, the task is clear to me, but I'm sure you know the deplorable state of armament of my division. Commander, at the front, some divisions are in even worse condition. Yours has an excellent reputation. I rely on you. In the last more or less favorable location of our position on the march, I tried to make sense of the theoretical discrepancies between my knowledge of strategy and our tactical task. I was struck by the inadequacy of the forces assigned to save Stalingrad. Not far in front of me, only 90 kilometers from the army surrounded in Stalingrad, were fighting two divisions. One of them, the 6th Panzer Division, was lucky because recently, when it was still based in France, it was brought to full combat readiness, and the second, the 23rd Panzer Division, according to rumors, was equipped even worse than mine. One staffed and two half-staffed divisions were to take the offensive to a depth of about a hundred kilometers all the way to Stalingrad. The so-called surprise was already gone. The two divisions involved in the battle were stopped by the superior forces of the Russians. But even if the surprise would have taken place, they would not have been able to stay deep in the captured area. No one could count on the fact that the enemy would not do everything in his power to prevent the unblocking of the encircled Sixth Army and thus consolidate its great victory. The weakness of the German attacks showed that there were no reserves available. Moreover, there was no question of Paulus's army still numbering 100,000 troops, breaking through to link up with the 4th Panzer Army. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. 15 to 16 December 1942, Map 1. On 15 December, units of the Russian 65th Tank Brigade and 81st Cavalry Division were found near Verkhmikarmoyarskaya. 
The commander of the German 4th Panzer Army intended, apparently, to send my division its left flank along the Don in a northeasterly direction. Accordingly, Biesing's tank group, he was the regimental commander, was ordered to move towards Verknikermoyerskaya via Topolov, which it reached without contact with the enemy. The motorized groups of Grenadier regiments did not reach the Shinkovskaya area until 16 December because of the delay of the crossing at Simlianskaya. Meanwhile, orders came from the 57th Army Corps that my division should suddenly reach Generalovsky, standing on the Aksai Isolovsky River, and seize a bridgehead there in order to relieve the pressure on the 6th Tank Division fighting east of this area. The enemy was reportedly to withdraw at least part of his forces from Verknikermoyerskaya and Nizhnyabloknoi and move them to the northwest, presumably to attack from the flank and rear the bridgehead at Selivskoy, which was already under heavy pressure from the front. The advancing tank group was unable to locate enemy forces on the Don. The day before, his units had moved north of Nagavskaya. The districts of Verknyabloknoi, Nizhnyabloknoi, and Verknikermoyerskaya were reportedly unoccupied by the enemy, but heavily mined. In the latter area, the bridge to the north was in enemy hands. Now the German tanks could not advance from the place they had reached. There was no fuel. All the roads had been rutted as a result of the thaw. The road along the Don, according to reports, was impassable, as was the road through Pachlebin, along which the corps commander intended to send my division. That evening, the long-awaited frost set in. During the day, the division had finished reconnaissance of roads suitable for all weather conditions, so that on the 17th it could move its wheel units, or even its tanks, in the direction of General Lovsko. I hoped to be able to move the tank group from its present positions to Verknijablokny, where it could join the division. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. 17 December 1942. Map 1. Leaving the area of concentration at 5 a.m., I led Zietz's group, consisting of the 63rd Grenadier Regiment, reinforced by the 27th Jager Platoon, Regimental Headquarters, the 3rd Platoon of the 27th Artillery Regiment, and one company of the 27th Reconnaissance Battalion, along a previously reconnoitered route through the points of Majorsky, Kotelnikovo, Verkniablokny, where we made a halt from 10. 15 to 11.00 in the direction of General Lovskoy, which we captured, and by 14.15, with weak enemy resistance, organized a bridgehead on the opposite bank. The only opposition from the enemy came from rocket launchers and attacks from aeroplanes on a shaving flight. The sudden introduction of a motorized group without tanks into the battle had the following results. 1. It was confirmed that the area west of the battle group to the Aksai Isolovsky section was free of the enemy. 2. All communications between the units of the 65th Tank Brigade, the 81st Cavalry Division, remaining on the Don, and the main forces that had moved to the northeast, which the enemy could still engage, were cut off. 3. The springboard for tomorrow's rush to attack the Russians from the right flank north of Aksai Isolovsky, where the German 4th Panzer Army could not advance a step. There are attacks against the enemy's organized line of tank defenses failed, and there were considerable losses. 4. We were warned of a similar operation on the part of the enemy, who, as we learned from radio intercepts, intended to use only motorized units to cut off the supply routes of our 6th Panzer Division along the coast. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. 18 December 1942, Map 2. On the night of the 17th, I tried to send as much reinforcements as possible to the new bridgehead, which we held with the small forces of the regimental group. But it did not arrive in time to be engaged in tank support for further offensive support on the 18th. Nevertheless, I decided to attack with the available forces, as this created a surprise effect. Two artillery batteries were attached to the 63rd Grenadier Regiment for this offensive. The tank regiment was moved to the bridgehead gradually one platoon at a time. Frost gave an opportunity to refuel the tanks with fuel. The plan was to hold this bridgehead until the rest of the regiment approached, after which to resume the attack. The first target was the collective farm, 
8 Martha, one of the key points of the entire Russian defense system. It was then planned to break through the Russian front with an attack on Verknikomsky and thus ensure the advance of the 6th Panzer Division along the whole front, which at the moment stopped on the left flank of the 4th Panzer Army. The advance of the 1st Tank Platoon was delayed because its commander had taken the wrong route. They went out on a slope on which the tanks, especially the T-4s, risked rolling down the icy crust below. Until I got to them and redirected the platoon along the road to the north, it was impossible to launch a concerted attack by the three main units. A fierce tank battle continued around this collective farm for a whole hour until the enemy finally retreated. This happened around 11.00. Fifteen enemy tanks were destroyed most of which were immobilized and used as fixed firing points. It is unclear whether this tactic was due to lack of fuel or the decision to stand to the death. The Manoeuvre tank battle was against enemy tanks coming from the north. Our tanks withdrew to the west and then attacked in a northeastern direction, forcing the enemy to retreat. Fortunately, the Russians did not choose the more effective tactic of attacking with tanks from the northwest, which would have caused confusion in my division. During this battle, a reinforced group of the 40th Grenadier Regiment, building on the success of the tank group, took the exposed left flank under its defense. It was reported from Corps headquarters that the enemy, confident that the attack was developing towards his right flank, was taking up a new line of defense along the heights north of Verknikomsko. We therefore abandoned the original plan, which envisaged such a turn of events and a frontal attack in this case by the 6th Panzer Division. Instead, we resumed the attack on the heights located to the northeast. But already at 15.00 darkness fell, and we were unable to complete the attack. Further attempts by the enemy to attack with tanks from the north were repelled this day without much difficulty. The 6th Panzer Division was also unable to advance significantly to the north and capture Verknikomsky on this day, as resistance was still strong. Another reason for this could have been that the tanks of the Russian 85th Tank Brigade, which according to available information, had advanced in the direction of Dorofiv, had left the southern bank of the river under the onslaught of the German division. During the attack of German units on the collective farm, Eight Marta Russian tanks were seen south of this point. They were retreating towards Verknikomskoy. Thus, the 6th Panzer Division again managed to occupy Dorofiv. On this day, it turned out to be possible not only to repel on the bridgehead threat to the 6th Panzer Division, but also to create a threat themselves deep into the right flank of the enemy. Everything had reversed itself. My division not only fought well, but in the course of this flexibly conducted offensive. For the first time in a long time, quickly adapted to my methods. Therefore, by sending an advanced battle group into the fight, I was able to achieve effective support for all three of the division's battle groups, a satisfactory result. My division lost 50 men killed, while the enemy lost one tank and 150 prisoners. His losses in killed have not been ascertained. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. 19 December 1942, Map 3. On this day and on the following night the fighting was not interrupted. It was the climax of the whole operation, for in an attempt to save the 6th Army reached the northernmost point, after which the retreat began. The battle took place in several stages. At 5 a.m. the assaulting units resumed their attack with the aim of capturing the stronghold at Verknikomskoy which was still stubbornly defended. Court's orders directed the 17th Panzer Division to advance in an easterly direction, northeast of this settlement, and to occupy the heights north of it. The enemy, forced to abandon Verknikomsky, could not be allowed to gain a foothold on these heights. At the same time during this attack, the 6th Panzer Division was to link up with mine and thus complete the encirclement of Verknikomskoy. By 6.20 a.m., the 63rd Assault Group had reached these heights from the south and the tank group from the north. But before the 6th Panzer Division managed to close the ring, from our front line reported rapid enemy movements on the preserved road between Verknikomskoy and Nishnikomskoy. Fire was opened from several hundred meters away, and at the same time our forward lines were bombed by our own aircraft, 
the pilots of which remained ignorant of the location of the division's forward detachment. To the south, the 63rd Assault Group was tasked with repelling a tank sortie from Verkhnkumskoy. By 9.00, the 6th Panzer Division had broken into it from the south. I had the impression that the ring around Verkhnkumskoy should very soon close. Insignificant groups of the enemy managed to break out of this locality from the other side. As the situation was changing rapidly, I decided, without waiting for orders from above, to terminate the operations of my tank group here and send it to pursue the enemy retreating from Verknikumsko to Nishnikumsko with the aim of reaching the Mishkova River section before the enemy could gain a foothold there and receive reinforcements from the north. The 63rd Group was ordered to make contact with the 6th Panzer Division and block the last northern exit from Verknikumskoy. As the enemy tanks aimed northeast, I deployed T-4 tanks to the left to protect the advance from the flank. They engaged, forcing the enemy tanks to retreat and knocking down several of them. Several times the forward group of tanks was attacked by our own dive bombers. By about 11 a.m. the ring around Verknikumskoy had closed, and this settlement was occupied and cleared. The remaining Russian units used the numerous folds in the terrain to withdraw in a southwesterly direction. Meanwhile, our tank group under my direct command was boldly advancing in the direction of Nizhnikumskoy. I considered it important to capture this settlement because it would provide defense of the flank of the 4th Army. And I also hoped to create a bridgehead behind the Mishkova River section in order to turn eastwards from there and resume the attack together with the neighboring 6th Panzer Division. At 12.45 we reached Nizhnikumskoy, part of which we occupied breaking the enemy resistance while our tanks surrounded this settlement. The northern bank of the river was occupied by fresh enemy forces approaching from the north, and they had an opportunity to link up with the units retreating from Verknikumskoy. A battalion of the 40th Group, sent after the tank platoon to provide infantry support, was unable to reach the place by daylight. Its advance was hampered by the ensuing darkness and the search for a road so it did not arrive there until 17.30. Previous reconnaissance on the division's left flank had established that large enemy forces were advancing in a southerly direction. Their advance was partly halted by a battalion of the 40th Group operating west of the collective farm, 8 Martha, partly by artillery operating on this section of the front. Apparently, these Russian forces had been pulled from the Don, before which they had occupied positions on that river, forming a front facing west. In some localities on the Don, such as Chosovskoy, reconnaissance found enemy units up to a battalion strength. The bridgehead at Generalovskoy, from which my division had withdrawn, could not be left to prevent its rear communications from being disrupted. It was also important to keep at least a battalion west of the collective farm, 8 Martha, to provide flank defense. Air reconnaissance showed that the village of Chernomorov, six kilometers northwest of Nizhnikumskoy, was occupied by the enemy, and this was confirmed by prisoners who reported that the 4th Mechanized Regiment of the Russians was there. Shortly after noon our court headquarters drew attention to the fact that, although my division's advance had so far carried the neighboring 6th Panzer Division, the 23rd Panzer Division following it had not broken out of its bridgehead at Kruglikov, Map 4. Then I ordered the 17th Panzer Division to turn sharply to attack Gromoslaka, and the tank group to turn and move east of Nizhnikumskoy to the same locality. The 63rd Group, which until then had been tied to Verknikumskoy, was also sent there. This attempt failed because from Verknikumskoy to Gromoslaka there was no direct road, and all the others were still in the hands of the enemy by nightfall. The last bulletin confirmed the situation in the entire area of responsibility of our corps. As expected, the enemy withdrew his troops only at the point of breakthrough in the direction of Verknikumskoy, Nishnikumskoy, and nowhere else on the front line occupied by our corps. Therefore, I decided to return the 63rd Group also to the area of Nishnikumskoy, and from there to deploy the main forces of the division to the east to support thereby their neighbors. 
but this meant that on the exposed left flank had to leave three battalions on a stretch of 25 kilometers to prevent a breakthrough of the enemy from the west and northwest. I decided to break through to Gromoslako along the northern bank of the Mishkova River. It was very difficult to attack from the south, as on the northern bank the enemy occupied dominant heights. 